The year is 1932. Soldiers march in orderly formation down a straight, newly opened road. Cheering crowds observe the procession from sidewalks and windows. At the head of the procession is Benito Mussolini, Prime Minister of Italy, known to his people as Il Duce. He is the leader of fascist Italy, and this road is the first big project in fascist Italy's mission to make the city of Rome one of the great cities of the world. It will play a major part in Mussolini's quest to link his rule over Italy to the glorious and triumphant days of Roman imperialism, not least because this new road will allow him to look out from his balcony with a clear line of sight to the Colosseum, perhaps the most famous and enduring symbol of Roman civilization. The Via dei Fori Imperiali, originally the Via del Impero, is a road in Rome that runs from the Piazza Venezia to the Colosseum. It also cuts through the sites of Rome's imperial forums, such as the Forum of Augustus, Forum of Nerva, and the Forum of Trajan. Millions of people walk along the road and around the grounds of the Roman forums every year. It would be easy to forget that the road and the archaeological discoveries that its construction facilitated are actually the result of a fascist political statement. Much of Rome is a palimpsest of sorts. Renaissance buildings are layered atop ancient monuments. Buildings are constructed of repurposed stones and marbles. Everywhere, it is evident that Rome is a living, breathing, evolving city. This road completely rejects this idea. In order to complete this project, Mussolini ordered the destruction of three Renaissance-era churches, the bulldozing of 5,500 units of housing, and the removal of an entire hill, which required the removal of 280,000 cubic meters of earth and 50,000 cubic meters of rock. Such destruction on such a large scale was part of the fascist regime's political program in the city of Rome, which called for the restoration of the monuments of ancient Rome to their uncovered glory. This preference for the city of Rome's ancient past, as opposed to the centuries of later history, reflected Mussolini's political program of Romanità, or Romanness, that defined fascist Italy's identity and relationship to its history. Mussolini stated, near the end of his life, that he had, quote, brought life to the emblems of the ancient Roman Empire to show the people of Italy they are the guardian of a great tradition. Fascist Italy famously appropriated the Roman salute, the Roman pattern of marching, and the pageantry of Roman triumphs in pursuit of the mythic ideal of Romanità. However, Italian fascism's appropriation of Roman history went deeper than these superficial symbols. Mussolini essentially made Roman history into a myth, using it to lend credence to the fascist claims of prosperity, empire, and civilization. The ultimate point was that fascism was the true heir and inheritor of this great Roman legacy, the ideology and the regime that was going to carry Italy both back to its past glories and forward to its future triumph. In this light, Mussolini's archaeological projects make a lot of sense. His claim that Italy was restoring Roman glory was made tangible and monumentalized in the form of great ancient Roman landmarks. Fascism's appropriation of ancient Rome played fast and loose with the facts of Roman history. Mussolini used Roman history to lend credibility to racist and discriminatory laws that fascist Italy implemented in the late 1930s. In 1938, he made the claim that, quote, the Romans of antiquity were incredible racists. The great struggle of the Roman Republic was this, to know if the Roman race was able to live alongside other races. Critical study of ancient Rome will reveal that there was no such thing as a unitary Roman race, and that additionally there was no equivalent to the modern skin color-based concept of race. However, Mussolini and the fascists were not shy about applying anachronistic racial ideology to the facts of Roman history. In the same year that Mussolini spoke of the ancient Romans as incredible racists, his archaeologists and architects were putting the final touches on the newly restored Mausoleum of Augustus. This mausoleum was first constructed by the first emperor of Rome, Augustus, to house his remains and the remains of his close family members. 
in the centuries after the collapse of the Roman Empire, it was repurposed multiple times as a castle, a garden, an amphitheater for bullfighting, and an auditorium for musical and theatrical performances. Like with the Imperial Forums, Mussolini is the reason you can go and see the mausoleum for yourself today in its bare, ancient Roman form. He ordered the excavation and restoration of the site of the mausoleum, which involved the destruction of the amphitheater and other leftover architectural features from the building's earlier uses. The fascists saw the removal of these other layers of Roman history as the removal of parasitical elements that were obscuring the glory of the ancient Roman past. In addition to this, Mussolini commissioned the restoration of the Arapacus, or the Altar of Peace. The ancient monument first constructed by Augustus was meant to be a monument representing the Pax Romana, or Roman peace, the peace that the Roman Empire brought to its territory. Before Mussolini's time, the Arapacus was buried under several feet of earth and a private building, but this did not stop him from ordering its surviving fragments dug up and moved across the city to be placed right next to the Mausoleum of Augustus as part of the new Piazza Augusto Imperatore. The Arapacus, the restored mausoleum, and this piazza were to serve as the centerpieces of a state-sponsored celebration known as the B. Millenario Augusteo, commemorating the 2000th anniversary of the Emperor Augustus's birth, and symbolizing a rebirth of all the Roman Empire's ideal. This restoration and ostentatious pageantry, it all came in service of creating the fascist ideological and mythic conception of Roman history. It was an attempt, as Aristotle Collis put it in a fine article on the subject, quote, to conquer and appropriate the historic layers of the city. Let's think about the Arapacus for a second. It's important to stress that this piece, the altar represented, the whole Pax Romana was more like pacification. Peace existed because all resistance to Roman imperial conquest had been crushed by overwhelming military might and horrific brutality, a desert called peace. Given fascist Italy's conduct in Ethiopia and Albania, well, it makes sense that the fascists were okay with constructing and rededicating an altar to Augustus's sort of imperial peace. Mussolini saw himself as a new Augustus of sorts, someone who was going to modernize Italy and bring the country into a new golden age just as Augustus had done. In the B. Millenario, his wise governance of Italy was directly compared to Augustus's, and everything that was glorious and hopeful about Augustan Rome was directly associated with Mussolini and fascist Italy. As we know, Mussolini's vision of a fascist-led future was not to be. He led Italy into the Second World War, which led ultimately to the fall of the fascist regime and the destruction of his imperial project. Perhaps the most lasting legacy of fascism, then, is the mark that these archaeological and architectural projects left on the city of Rome. In the decades after fascism, debates have raged about what to do with these fascist legacies. Many have proposed tearing up the Via dei Fori Imperiali, for example, in order to connect the imperial forums that it runs straight through, as well as to erase one of the most tangible remaining reminders of the fascist regime. Others argue that this sort of destruction and erasure is exactly what the fascists were doing, and that fascism too is a part of Rome's multi-layered history whose physical legacy should not be intentionally effaced. This whole subject raises interesting questions about the goals and ideologies behind archaeology. What histories do we consider to be most valuable, worth preserving, and worth unearthing? Is it worth unearthing buildings and artifacts from important historical eras if doing so requires the destruction of other buildings and artifacts that also represent important histories? All of this should also serve as a warning. We must be vigilant against misreadings of history done in service of present political projects. Given the rise of right-wing and neo-fascist movements across the world, it is important that we critically examine how history, through ideological distortion of historical realities and physically destructive historical narrative building, can be made into dangerous myths and ideals.